There's an interesting passage where the Buddha defines the different aggregates in terms of verbs. Form deforms. Feelings feel, perceptions perceive. Fabrications fabricate, and consciousness cognizes. The point being that these are activities. The word aggregate has an unfortunate connotation. It sounds like gravel, little bits and pieces of rock. And it probably got that name from a convention they had in early modern European philosophy. There were systems and there were aggregates. Systems were collections of things that actually worked together for a purpose. Aggregates were just random collections of things. And so when the early translators came to translate the word kanda, which means heap in Pali, they chose aggregate to give the sense that these are discrete things that don't necessarily work together. The thing is, we try to make them work together. This is where that definition of the aggregates as verbs because begins to get interesting. Because fabrication is also translated or defined as intention. And its role when, with regard to the other aggregates is that it takes a potential for each other's aggregates, it makes it into an actual experience of that activity. In other words, there's a potential for form coming from your past actions. There's a potential for feeling and so on. And through our intentions, we take that potential and we turn it into an actual aggregate for the sake of having that aggregate. Of course, that aggregate then is for the sake of what? Well, it depends on the intention. As the Buddha points out, our main tendency is simply to cling to these aggregates. We carry them around. He says, as he says, they're a burden. You can think of a pile of bricks that you picked up and you're carrying around in a sack over your back. Or the image they have in Thailand is the old grandmother who has a huge load of straw that she carries around on her back all the time, hoping that someday it'll t become useful. You never know when you're going to need straw, so she's going to have it on hand all the time. And of course, she weighs herself down needlessly. And so when you claim these aggregates and turn them into our sense of ourselves or things belonging to us, we're going to suffer. Now the way out of this dilemma is to change our intentions. We take those same potentials and we can turn them into a path, a path to the end of suffering. This is what we're doing as we practice, the practice of virtue. We're going to be involved in perceptions and feelings and fabrications around our actions, telling the body to do this, telling the body to do that, telling it not to do this, not to do that, as a way of gaining some sense of our power here. By changing our intentions, these potentials turn into something else. like the oil they found coming out of rocks in Pennsylvania back in the 19th century. At first it was just a nuisance, and then they decided to make medicine out of it. They put it in bottles and sold it as medicine for you. It wasn't very good for you. Then finally someone realized you could use it to power things by burning it. Now, that may not be a very good analogy because we found that there's trouble that comes when you burn oil that way, especially when you burn a lot of it. But it's a question of something that was a nuisance can actually be put to use, or something that's put to a bad use can be turned around and put to a better use. And so it is with the aggregates, especially when we come to concentration. You've got the form of the body, the breath that you're focusing on, the feeling of pleasure you're trying to create by the way you focus. The perception of the breath as a whole body process that helps you stay with the breath and helps that feeling of pleasure to spread through the body. 
the fabrication, the directed thought and evaluation by which you adjust the breath, adjust the mind so they get just right. And even when you get past the first jhana, there will be the intention to stay with the breath. That's also fabrication. And then there's consciousness aware of all these things. So you put this together and try to make it as solid as you can. Because you want to use this state of concentration for a lot of purposes. One of them, to begin with, is to learn how to pry yourself away from the hindrances. It's a lot easier to let go of sensual desire, ill will, and the rest, when you've got something good to hold on to. And then you can use those aggregates to analyze well, what is that particular desire made out of? What is that ill will made out of? Well, they're going to be perceptions and feelings. Even with the way you breathe will have an impact on some of those hindrances. It's part of the appeal, or part of the sense of urgency when anger comes in and you breathe in a way that's very uncomfortable. And ordinarily, you would feel, well, I've just got to get it out of my system. Why? Because the breath has changed. But as you've got the state of concentration, you can step back and say, well, I can change the way I breathe, so I'm not faced with the simple choice either of exploding or bottling up this uncomfortable energy in the body. There's a more skillful alternative. Just dissolve the tightness and tension in that way of breathing away. So it's important that you get the concentration solid. And you maintain that intention to be concentrated, to be mindful as you go through the day. To make this your center of gravity. Now there will come a time where you change your intention toward the concentration, you start taking it apart too. But don't be in too great a hurry, because there's other work that needs to be done first. Peeling away your attachments to the distractions. Because the Buddha wants to get you attached here, so that when you finally do turn your attention on the fabricated nature of the concentration and start trying to develop this passion for it, that's the intention, and use the perceptions that would lead to this passion seeing the concentration as being inconstant, even though there's a solid state of well-being. It has its ups and downs. It has to be maintained, which means there's stress involved in it. And thinking of it in those ways, seeing it is not worthy of identifying with as you or yours. You simply see the potentials for concentration as they have come to be. Without turning them into concentration, you develop some dispassion for them, and that's when you're freed. And a lot of people want to go straight to that, seeing things as they have come to be, or sometimes as is translated, seeing things as they are. But when the Buddha lists the stages in the practice, it always comes after getting the mind in concentration. And that's because you want to pry away your attachments to other things first. Have only the concentration as your big attachment. So when you finally peel away your attachment here, then you really are freed. Otherwise, if you simply note at the very beginning, well, yes, my concentration isn't constant because it hasn't been mastered, and think that it's wise or discerning to see its inconstancy and that it's stressful and not self, you just fall back to your old attachments. The Buddha wants you to put yourself in a new place. Your concentration is the center of your sense of well-being, and then you work from there. So the practice is largely practice in training your intentions. And what are intentions? What's your karma? This is why the Buddha called himself a karma wadi. Someone who teaches karma, teaches action, with a focus particularly on the intentions of the mind. So be very careful about your intentions, how you engage with these various potentials that you find in your awareness. One of the reasons our lives are so scattered is because our intentions tend to be scattered. And here we're trying to bring some order into them. 
recognizing the intentions that will lead to attachment and clinging, i.e. more suffering, the intentions that turn those aggregates into the path, and then followed by the intentions to let go of the path when it's done its work. Those are the three main stages. And it's a matter of mastery, a matter of perfecting your skills. It makes all the difference, and it will lead you to where you want to go when you do these trainings in their proper order, and particularly when you give a lot of importance to concentration. This is why the Buddha singled it out in his verses on respect. He talks about respect for the triple training, and then he adds on, and respect for concentration. Now concentration is there in the triple training, but he wants to emphasize the point that you really do want to work on your concentration. Because that's how the dynamic of the practice works. The other stages, the higher stages, work because your concentration is solid. So content yourself to be right here. Try to find a real sense of pleasure right here. Learn how to be with the pleasure and not lose your focus. In the Buddhist terms, be with pleasure, but don't let it invade your mind and remain there. It can remain. It's there. You're working on it, but don't wallow in it. Appreciate it. Learn how to be with it so that it can do its work. And you find that that particular aggregate, the aggregate of feeling, together with the perception that maintains it, the fabrication, the intention that maintains it, is a path that really does take you someplace, in the Buddhist terms, to, where, to reach what you have not yet reached, to attain what you have not yet attained, to realize what you have not yet realized. And you're able to do that because you've gained some mastery that you have not yet gained over your intentions. So that's where the work is. Try to keep focused on it. If you don't maintain that focus, life just gets scattered. Your intentions pull you here, pull you there, weigh you down. But as you master the steps of the path, you take that pile of bricks on your back, and you put it down, and you make it a path. And then ultimately, you turn it into a runway, and you take off. As the Buddha said, those who have gained full awakening are like birds flying through space. They have no path that can be traced. But they get up there because they've done a good job of making that runway. That's what you're working on now.